Hello, Winning Investor Nation. Welcome to Monday Market Insights right here on the Winning Investor Daily YouTube channel. Good to see everyone here today, especially Ian. How are you today, Ian? I'm doing well, Amber. Good morning. Good morning to Alex, who is yes. his usual sleepy self. Yes, he was awake earlier, but now he's done for, for today. <laughs> <laughs> So, Ian, I'd just like to kick things off with some U.S. economic news with a focus on housing. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, the U.S. economic news this week will be, I would say, squarely focused on the housing market with two major releases. One will be Wednesday and the other Thursday. We're mm -hmm. looking at September's housing starts and existing home sales, respectively, on those days. Now, housing is one market where the present as well as the near future outlooks look temporarily, I'll say temporarily dim, all due to the rising interest rate environment we're in, uh, with mortgage rates at a 16-year high, topping 6.9%. A, a mortgage payment today, Ian, is up nearly 50% year over year. And mortgage rates will increase further as the Fed continues on its quest to squash inflation. So as a result, existing home sales are down in recent months. And this actually coupled with a, a surge in newly built homes now waiting on the sidelines with less home buyers available for now, for now, uh, due to lower housing affordability. Uh, therefore, in November, we can expect to see a 75 basis point hike, uh, which will further cool the housing market. But all is not lost. As we say here at Winning Investor Daily, in this current environment, Bad news in the U.S. economy is good news for our stocks, our stocks, as the Fed will eventually see evidence of a U.S. slowdown um, from housing to wage growth, as well as inflation steady rise cooling. Uh, they'll slow their rate hikes. Uh, housing affordability, unaffordability will ease and a new generation, new generations of home buyers, and from millennials to Gen Z's will purchase needed homes. They need homes uh, for their household formations. And for us, as the Fed uh, rate hikes slow, uh, we'll see a great shift in a share price rise in our unfairly downbeaten 2.0 growth stocks that were the first to decline in this bear market. Uh, these growth stocks are hand-selected, future forward companies winning Investor Nation with a compelling, innovative uh, products. They have cash on hand. They are ripe for long-term investment. So the way we can see it, I see it, today's market is really a prime buying situation for our strategic fortunes and extreme fortunes, a model portfolio, stocks, if I've ever seen one in. So what do you think about that? You know, you touched on a good point there, Amber, and, and that is the, the true irony of growth stocks is that they outperform when growth slows. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is that fund managers have to find growth somewhere. So they go to find the stocks that are growing the fastest in a slow growth uh, economy. You know, when the economy is running on full cylinders, you can buy all the cyclical stocks and you kind of shun the, the growth stocks. So, so the fact that the economy will slow down I believe is going to be good for growth stocks. But I want to talk more about the housing market because, you know, you brought up we have uh, new home sales coming out later this week. And, you know, Amber, we've seen this sort of dichotomy mm -hmm. in the economic numbers, which I think is really important for people to understand. The new home numbers, anything related to the mortgage market has come in worse than expected, right? Last week, you had the purchase apps that were down 40% year over year. Mm -hmm. You've got this week with new home sales, which is probably going to be less than expected. Mm -hmm. On the, At the same time, though, you still have the jobs numbers that are running faster than economists anticipate. And you also have had the inflation numbers that are still running hot. They're kind of been in line. Mm -hmm. uh, it hasn't shown too much of an acceleration. But you know, this is the thing is that interest rates went up over the summer, the mortgage rates, which were earlier this year at 3%. And then in the summer, you saw 5%, then you saw 6%. Now we're closing on at 7% right now. So that's why the first thing you're going to see is uh, people stop buying houses. Mm -hmm. And when they stop buying houses, they stop doing renovations mm -hmm. and then they stop furnishing them. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to see consumer spending really contract because housing and autos are really the two pillars of our economy. And, and so the fact that housing is slowing down is gonna make, it will feed its way into the data in terms of inflation and also in terms of uh, the jobs numbers that come out every month. Mm -hmm. But I also wanna share uh, with, with our viewers this really uh, interesting statistic that if you took out a $400,000 30 year 
uh, mortgage, right? You know, your typical conforming loan in 2021, right? And you mm -hmm. had a 3.05% interest rate. Right. Your monthly payment would have been $2,147. That same loan amount today at a 6.92% mm -hmm. is $3,089. You're looking at almost $1,000 or more in monthly payments. Mm -hmm. And so if you're you know, thinking, why is the housing market slowing down? Well, it's right here. It, the, the the typical half a million dollar home is just not you know affordable for somebody that wants to spend two thousand dollars a month on their mortgage and principal. Mm -hmm. And the the last thing that I want to say about this is okay, yeah. So the rates have gone up, and now people are worried about the the mortgage market, and so. The thinking immediately goes to, you know, what's next? Are we going to have another housing crisis? Remember, like great, great financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And the the likely answer is no. And here's why: the actual uh, structure of the mortgage market is different. Okay, so ninety percent of home loans right now are thirty year fixed. Okay, mm -hmm. and people have locked into low rates. Everybody refinanced. You know, during the low rate cycle that we had the last two, three years, if you didn't, I mean, what were you doing? <laughs> um, and but back then, during 2008, the the mortgage market was much more skewed to these floating rate loans. OK, so when interest rates went up in 2008, these floating rate borrowers immediately saw their their monthly payments increase, you know, sometimes by three to five times what they were paying. And so that led to this wave of selling. Right now, you have people that are basically locked in for 30 years right. and, you know, they're not they're just not going to sell. So that is going to keep supply out of the market mm -hmm. from natural sellers who might you know, normally have sold when, when rates go higher. So, you know, the problem is going to be we got to build new homes faster for mm -hmm. this huge generation that is starting their household formation years, the millennials. And because the reality is people are not going to sell their house unless they, because then they have to go take out a, a higher rate mortgage unless they get divorced or die. Right. I mean, those are the two reasons why you would, would, would have to move into something where you're paying a much higher mortgage rate. Mm -hmm. But in general, I think six months from now, when the economy slows down, you're going to see that mortgage rate back under 5% and things will resume some type of normal pace where you will be able to not be locked. You know, you won't be worried about being locked in for 30 years in your house. Mm -hmm. If you want to downsize, you know, you can go sell it and then buy something and, and keep an interest rate and mortgage rates. That's the same. There are some countries around the world, by the way, that mm -hmm. allow you to take your mortgage with you. So, you know, if you've locked in, let's say $400,000 at a 30 year term at 3%, and now the 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 normal rate, you know, is six percent. You can actually move and take that original mortgage with you to the new house as long as it conforms to the same standards that the banks are looking for. So, you know, the the net net of this, Amber, is that mm -hmm. the housing market is going to slow. It is going to slow the economy. You're going to see all you know, furniture companies are going to get hit first. Home Depot, Lowe's, you've already seen them trade off. Uh, other other uh, big box wholesalers like Target uh, have have seen inventory levels climb. Oh, yeah. And that eventually is going to make its way into the jobs number and also the CPI. So that is why the mortgage market is is really so important to watch. It's 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 imperative that we keep an eye on that. It's a wonderful breakdown, Ian, especially on just looking at the housing market as a whole and what we can expect going forward. So, Ian, we were talking before we began filming and you mentioned you like to share a, spe a specific chart and it shows a small cap forward PE well below long term average range. Would you care to share that with everyone what we were talking about before we began? I'd love to. And and I think this is very important to understand. So when when you're looking at if you're an, an asset allocator, you're thinking about what sectors to buy. Mm -hmm. Really, the, the sector that's come down the hardest and been hit the most is small cap. So I want to just show you this from Bank of America's research. Small cap forward PEs, which means their price versus their earnings within the next 12 months, is the lowest it's been since really 1991. And it's even lower than it was during the great financial crisis in 2008, right? The median for the small cap forward PE is about 16. It's trading at about 11, close to 10 right now. So it just tells you that small caps are dirt cheap right now. Now, the reason for this is that when you are on the verge of slowing down the economy, small caps get hit the hardest, especially when interest rates are going up. 
because small caps have a harder time raising capital. Okay. They're not, you know, triple A rated uh, multinational companies that can just call up Goldman Sachs and say, Hey, you know, we need a couple billion dollars uh, and they get their finance easy. Small caps typically uh, either have to raise capital in the junk debt markets, which the rates are skyrocketing right now, or they have to sell more stock. Okay, so that's why the PEs have come down significantly. Now, the flip side of this is that when the economy recovers, small caps actually rally back the fastest because they benefit most from an improved economy. And you saw this phenomenon happen back in early 2017 after Trump was elected, mm -hmm. right? When the Republicans came to office, they cut a bunch of regulations that were great for small caps, and you saw small caps take off. I believe that we are getting to the point where you know small caps are going to outperform. They've underperformed for the last couple of years, but I think that they're going to outperform as we figure out where the bottom is in this cycle, right? When the mm -hmm. Fed gets to its terminal rate, four and a half, five percent, mm -hmm. that is going to be the bottom of the market. The stocks you want to buy are the ones that are going to benefit the most from the next bull market. And Amber and I, mm -hmm. I want to announce this now, we have worked on research, we went back decades to look at this, to find the stocks that tend to outperform, the small cap stocks that are the best positioned to outperform. Uh, we're releasing a webinar October 20th, right, Amber? That's right. Uh, please click the link if you want to learn more about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll explain to you exactly what this indicator is and how it can help you profit in small caps in the next bull cycle, which, you know, could have started last week with this big uh, rally we're seeing in the markets right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't know where the bottom is, but eventually we'll have a bottom and we're going to have a big bull cycle that you're not going to want to miss out on. Make sure you have some investments in small cap. Click the link again. Check out our webinar uh, on October 20th. Perfect, Ian. Yes. And just so you know, you can click the bull icon as well, right, right here over my shoulder uh, to sign up for this free event. And it will be October 20th, this Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern time called Bear Market Fortunes. All right. Uh, hey, awesome, Ian. So we have a question that's coming from a loyal uh, watcher of Monday Market Insights. It's mm -hmm. Mr. Wright. Hello, Mr. Wright. Thank you for writing us so diligently. And he has a crypto question for you, Ian. So okay. I can read this out for everyone and you can read along. Um, Mr. Wright says, I have questions about some of the cryptocurrencies that I have purchased. I need to learn more about when I buy in when the price is less than a penny. It's a process hmm. before I start earning, but I'm kind of confused. Uh, based on this screenshot, this particular screenshot that we can all see, here is the current price uh, for the crypto, the yearn that he's focusing, focusing on. Then he says, and, and this screenshot shows my first initial buy-in. It was half of a penny. So I'm confused thinking that I bought 100 pennies per dollar a share when it was only a half of a penny purchased. Uh, please help me navigate this, Ian. <laughs> All right, Mr. Wright. Great question. So mm -hmm. let me just go over the screenshot he sent with the $40 investment on it. To, mm -hmm. so everyone can be on the same page here. Mm -hmm. So so basically, you bought a protocol called Yearn Finance, okay? And it, it's a cryptocurrency that controls what's known as a yield aggregator. I'm not going to get too much into the weeds on that right now, but it's basically a decentralized finance play. And um, you purchase it with 40 US dollars, okay? And when you see like at the bottom, how there's 0.00482723, that is how much of the cryptocurrency that you are able to purchase with $40. You got 0 0.004 of one urine token because the urine token right now is priced at about $8,000, okay? Now, the reason why they do this is because each cryptocurrency is divisible by one one hundredth million, right? So the idea that Satoshi Nakamoto proposed was that Bitcoin could be worth, and, and by the way, one one hundredth millionth of a cryptocurrency has a name, it's called a Satoshi, okay? We call it SAT, S-A-T for short. And the idea was that Bitcoin's price could continue to go up and you never would have to split Bitcoin, right? You know, you don't split it like they split Tesla stock. Bitcoin is at 20,000, it could, was it 60,000, it could be 
500,000 in a few years, a million by the end of this decade. And you will be able to buy a small fraction of it, a one one hundredth millionth of it, so that when the price of Bitcoin is 100 million, I mean, please God, maybe, right, Amber? In a couple you of never decades, know. You never know. <laughs> Uh, one Satoshi would be worth one US dollar. Mm -hmm. okay, so that's that's why they do that. And so what you're seeing when you look at the amount you have is 0.00482723 sats, Satoshis. And that's how they break down cryptocurrencies. Because I know a lot of people get tripped up by that because they're like, oh, you know, I bought $100 worth of this, but it only shows me that I have like less mm -hmm. than a penny of the token. Mm -hmm. uh, you own $100 of it but you only have a fractionalized small piece of that token because it's the price of the underlying token is $7,000 or $8,000. Hmm. Okay. Well, I think that's a well-stated explanation. I hope you had your question answered, Mr. Wright. If not, let us know. And thank you, Ian, for spending some time answering Mr. Wright's question. Well, thanks, thanks, Mr. Wright, for taking the time to write in. Mm -hmm. So, Ian, I really like what you said. I love what you said actually, earlier about in the housing market. You've stated uh, we've got to build new homes faster. Mm -hmm. So I just this really parlays into what I want to talk about today for our Megatrend highlight. So focusing back on the housing market, uh, despite its current slowdown, we as innovative investors must look forward. And of course, Ian's statement that we must build new houses faster. Um, nothing spells future forward housing innovations than 3D printed homes. So in Ithaca, New York, a company based in Ithaca, New York, it's a design studio named HANA, has begun work on something called CORES. And it's a building in Houston, Texas, that's slated to be the first multi-story 3D printed structure to be completed in the United States. According to DZine.com, the quote hybrid structure is being constructed from 3D printed concrete combined, combined with wood framing uh, with a 4,000 square foot living space. This home is meant to be scalable and compatible with typical timber frame constructions, which is cool. Uh, the project actually showcases the possibilities of 3D printing technology, mass customization, and design solutions that integrate conventional construction uh, methods of those types of construction methods with a, hybrid, a hybridized construction method that combines concrete 3D printing with wood framing. So this approach actually allows for the two material systems to be used strategically, and it aims to actually increase the applicability of 3D printing in the U.S., where framing is one of the most common construction type materials and techniques. So isn't that great? I think it's fantastic, Ian, to see what we've been following for a long time now, 3D printing and 3D printing home construction. This tech is just evolving every day. I love the ideas that are coming forward. And this concrete timber hybrid build, well, that's just something that we have to watch going forward. I think it's really phenomenal. What do you think? I mean, absolutely. Anything that can bring the cost of building new houses down mm -hmm. is going to benefit us. One of the structural problems that we have mm -hmm. is that builders have focused on the very high ends of markets for mm -hmm. the last 14 years since the financial crisis. Yes. The reason for that is the margins are much better, right? Yes. If you're a developer, you're going to build a mega mansion. But the problem is, you know, the the millennials are not buying mega mansions. They need starter homes. We need more of that in the, in the United States. I think that combined with work from home and the ability really to to live anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. If you're working from home, you don't have to live inside of a city. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing a renaissance really in cities across the country that aren't New York, San Francisco, and LA. And I think that if we're able to build cheaper homes and allow millennials to to create household formation that is going to be the driving engine of our economy mm -hmm. and unless we forget the average age of the millennial is 33 years old right now right and they're they're the second largest demographic and they might be bigger than baby boomers mm -hmm. um but they're, they're at least the second or close to the baby boomers demographic mm -hmm. and they are at the exact age of household formation right so Whatever you want to say about millennials, they eat too much avocado toast or they're living in their parents' basements. Look, if we can make houses cheaper for them and get this ball rolling, right? Keep the the housing market rolling because it's such a, a, a huge part of our economy. Yes. It's going to benefit all of us. So, you know, so 
I, I just love to hear new applications of technology like 3D printing for new homes because I, I understand how much we need to have new homes built in the United States. Maybe we could just like grab all those empty structures that China has and like ship them, drone them over to the US because they've got, you know, one ghost city after another. And that would help solve part of our housing crisis. <laughs> That's an idea there, Ian. Maybe oh, Elon Musk can figure that out, yeah. Amber. I don't know. Yeah, he can figure out most things. So you never know there either. <laughs> So Ian, so that's it for that I have for this week. Uh, we covered our major topics, economics topics, uh, macroeconomics, crypto, and of course, megatrends. Do you have anything else you'd like to add for this week before we yeah, start? Yeah, one more thing. Something we discussed earlier before yeah. our call, how we're living in unprecedented times. Mm -hmm. I just want to throw this table up for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, this comes from Charlie Biello uh, and, at Compound Research. And it shows the S&P 500 and the US 10-year treasury, which is typically your 60-40 portfolio, right? So most people have a, a weighted portfolio where they've got 60% bonds, 40% stocks. This is the only, there's only been five years since the Great Depression where, including this year, where stocks and bonds are both down right? Stocks and bonds are typically negatively correlated. That means when the stock market is selling off because we're worried about the economy, the bond market will rally because of growth slowdown. Now, it's very rare we're in these periods where you have inflation and a potential slowdown at the same time. This is one of them. And this is the only year in history where both are down more than 10%. So, you know, if, if you think that we, and, and I also note that if you look at these other years that happened, the S&P 500 was significantly green in most cases the year after that. Okay, mm -hmm. so I, I, something here is, is going to give. I think either the, the bond market is going to stop selling off, right, which means rates are going to come down. If rates come down, that is going to be good for growth stocks primarily because you have to uh, discount their the future value of present cash flows buy an interest rate in the future. And that is more important for growth stocks, which are going to be earning more money, you know, five, six years from now, not here in the medium term. So, you know, take a look at this table. Just we live in, in unprecedented times. But again, you know, it, it felt like 2020 was an unprecedented time. It was an unprecedented time. And it was a generational buying opportunity at the lows during the COVID crisis. Yep. You know, I have no doubt that we will look back at this period as well and say, you know, this was not the time to panic and, and dump all your stocks uh, because people were warning you that another Great Depression was around the corner. Uh, we seem to have nicely avoided that for the last 90 years. And, um, you know, I think this would be the same. One other note on that, too, because I know a lot of people like to pass these charts around, Amber, mm -hmm. that compare, you know, the Great Financial Crisis and the mm -hmm. stock chart. And then we are here, the Great Financial Crisis dropped and <clears throat> now looks really similar. Right. Well, if you look between 1900 to 1920 and 2000 to 2020, mm -hmm. those charts look almost exactly the same. The mm -hmm. S&P 500 is up about 125% in the last 20 years. That is not that much if you consider, you know, some of the great decades that we've had in the past that have seen 200, 300% gains. Right. And if, look, if we're hitting the 1920 period, I mean, that was one of the greatest decades for stocks of all time. So I'll leave it at that. If if the if the, the twenty if the two thousand to two thousand twenty looks like nineteen hundred to nineteen twenty, we're about to hit one of the greatest uh, uh, convergences of technology uh, in history. And you know we had the Roaring Twenties back then. It, it it is not out of the equation that we can't have the Roaring Twenties here uh, once again because of all the converging technologies that we've been following and trying to bring to you every week. Great, great concept and comparison there, Ian. Thank you for sharing that idea. Okay, so that's it for this week. And anything farther you'd like to add? That's it. Just want to thank everyone for tuning in and, and make sure if you haven't signed up for the small cap webinar mm -hmm. on Thursday, October 20th at 1 p.m. Yes. Sorry, I have a lot of numbers in my head sloshing around. <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs>
<laughs> you got it. That's the answer. Thank you everyone for watching. Thank you for writing in and commenting on these YouTube channel videos. We appreciate you so much and know that you can follow Ian and me on Twitter. Ian is at Invest with Ian and I am at A Lancaster Guru. And of course, we appreciate it. Any thumbs ups, comments, or of course, subscriptions to this YouTube channel going forward. We wish you a wonderful week ahead. And until next time, please take care. And don't be afraid to ask some questions. Mr. Wright had a great question. This week. Oh, yeah. That was an awesome question for Mr. Yeah. Wright. Thank you again, Mr. Wright. Okay, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you.